Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds. Tonight's topic is a family profile. I do these every so often. And tonight we're talking about wrens. Wrens are one of the most popular groups of birds, uh, in, especially in our hemisphere, the New World, as it's called, the North America, South America, Central America, all through there. Uh, they are, there are 88 species of wrens total in the world and all but one of those uh, occur on this side of the planet there's only one species of wren that occurs over in the what we call the old world and that's the eurasian wren uh and tonight i was i'm featuring the ones that can be found here throughout north america uh and you uh, i don't know there's a play uh, anywhere in north america that you don't have at least one wren that is in your area. And like I said, they are one of the most popular groups. They are small insectivorous birds that have, uh, you know, have what we call decurved bill, long decree kind of turns down a bit. Uh, and they are, you know, they have a habit of uh, cocking their tails up in the air as a, a typical posture. And all of them are pretty well known for their songs. They, uh, they all have they're all very boisterous, you know, and, and some more so than other. We're going to play songs for you tonight. Let you listen to some of those. Um, and then we're just going to cover the wrens that are here. Now, some of these we're not going to spend a lot of time on because they're uh, yeah, they're, they're more secretive and they're also more remote. They're in, in, in habitat-specific regions, uh, whereas some are very, very common. And there's none that is more common than the house wren. Or the, it, I know... My whole life, I've heard them called Jenny Wrens as well, but this is the house wren. It is one of the most widely spread songbirds on the planet. Now, look, and especially in this on this side of the planet, I should say, look how look at this range map. And all these range maps are from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and they do an outstanding job. And you can see that they nest all the way up, well up into Canada, all the way through North America to the Caribbean, down into Mexico, South America, and all the way down to the southern tip of South America. So the house wren is an amazing little creature, uh, and it migrates uh, at, you know, great distances, uh, and it can also, uh, some may only migrate a short distance, but they are very widespread all over, and uh, they are one of the more common birds that uh, in, in your backyard uh, all across the country. Uh, now, in the, in the deep south, uh, we don't really hear them sing very much because they're only there in the winter months, uh, but in uh, the, the breeding regions, which are, you know, that orange and yellow color on the earth. They're a very common sound, that's for sure. My backyard is, I hear them all the time. I'll play a song for you. This is the house wren, typical for uh, really the Eastern US, United States song. They may vary a little bit in their Western um, song, but this is the most common song. Every day, <laughs> I hear that in my backyard from the time they arrive here, usually late April uh, in, in the Kansas City region. Uh, they're still singing now. They typically have two broods. And I've done whole videos on the house wren and the Carolina wren, which are the two most common in, in Eastern North America. But the house wren, very widespread. A couple of, uh, there are different subspecies that we can, we can notify. Some of them, I know I was just in Cozumel this uh, past winter, the Cozumel wren, as it's known as, is a house wren, but it looks quite a bit different. A white, really white throat um, and a longer bill and a slight, slightly different song, but it's still considered a house wren. Um, in the Western United States, the, the colors can vary. You know, they, they like I said, the wrens in the, uh, cover the browns and the grays very well. Uh, they're not real flashy like the warblers and, and the tanagers and things like that, but they are great songsters and they are the ultimate insect <laughs> gathering machines. The, the, those bills are made for getting up into crevices and pulling out, especially spiders uh, and, and other insects out of there. And they find insects all the time. I, I tell the story of, of a Carolina wren one winter jumping up on the side of a building and reaching up and, and 
on their piece of board and came out with a, a, a spider and gobbled it right up. They, and there was snow on the ground. So they're really good at finding insects all the time. So the house wren is number one, and it is uh, at, at the most widespread. So most of you have a good chance of uh, having house wrens at least some part of the year with you. And the next two, uh, because I have, you know, I've talked about limited number of slides, so I had to combine some for uh, to get all of them in. But the Carolina wren, the one on the upper left, one of my favorite birds, a state bird of South Carolina, and I'm from North Carolina, but you can tell the map there to the right of him is it shows you the eastern two thirds up to about the Great Lakes region in there. Uh, and it, and they, it doesn't migrate. Those are year round uh, areas for them. Now they are primarily a Southern bird. And so up on those Northern fringes, which includes us here in Kansas city and you guys up along those uh, Northern border States, they get hurt really bad by harsh winters, like long periods of frozen conditions, um, a heated bird bass, keep them alive. A lot of times in those situations, but the Carolina wren is a, is, it's a real favorite of a lot of people. Again, another bird that sings all the time. Here's here's a Carolina song. I I learned it, you know, and it's written tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. But I always tell I learned it, cheeburger, burger, chee burger, chee burger. So let's listen to, the, to his song. I tell you that bird sings 365 days a year. Like if you've got a Carolina wren in your backyard or near your house, uh, even in the dead of winter, uh, it, 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 it early in the morning you will hear the Carolina wren vocalizing. They they definitely do, and there's lots of different little vo vocalizations they do. But that song is really really famous. And the bird that looks most like it, and you can see the map of the Carolina wren on the right. And look at the count, the map on the left, and that is the Bewix wren, which is the picture below. And you look at that, those two uh, birds, and you can see the similarities. The, uh, you know, the, the creamy belly of the Carolina wren versus the white belly of the Bewix wren. And there's white outer tail feathers on a Bewix wren. And they have long tails proportionally. Uh, and they, they, like the Carolina wrens, will come in and eat. Uh, from bird feeder stations, sometimes like hola sunflower, peanut pieces, suet, and especially you have mealworms. They love mealworms as well. But the Bewix wren used to occur out in the eastern U.S., up in North Carolina, where I'm from, in that area. But they have long since been driven out from that area. And they say, and what the science tells us is it was the, the spread of house wrens that ran off the the Bewix wrens and driven them west. And it, it, so it's interesting. They, they've really been displaced out east, but now in, it, you still find them um, in the south and southwest. And the Bewix wren has a song that to me, it, it's, <laughs> I remember the first time I heard one, I actually thought it sounded kind of like a toey to me. So let's see what you think. Here's the Bewix wren. I also think it's reminiscent of a song sparrow. So the, the Bewix wren, again, it, it can be very urban. And uh, both of these guys will nest in nest boxes. But for the most part, they find their own place where they want to nest. I always say Carolina wrens put up the best nest box in the world for them. And they'll nest in an old pair of shoes you left out on your deck. So it, 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 they're very opportunistic when it comes to that. Uh, they, their nesting habits. So they're beautiful birds, very strong. And they're eating the insects like crazy out of your garden, believe me. Now, the other bird that occurs um, really very widespread, uh, it, it, this, is that, this is the bird along with the Eurasian wren. These three birds used to be lumped together in one species just called the winter wren. But a few years ago with DNA work, they, they split them out into three different species. Now we have the winter wren, which is in the eastern U.S., and especially it breeds up north, and we see them here in our area in the winter months in the south. And then the Pacific wren, which is 
the Pacific Northwest, as it shows, is a much is a darker version of the winter wren. But the three of them together, when you see them pictures of them, you'll have a hard time telling the three of them apart. And their songs are what really uh, separate them out. So these little tiny guys, they act like mice. Uh, and I always look for them when I'm looking for them in, when they're here in winter. I look for fallen trees along creeks and streams and kind of low wetter areas. Um, that's where they tend to uh, nest uh, in evergreen forest in the north where in, when they're in winter, I, they, they hang around those wet low areas with fallen trees and they, people describe them as scurrying around like a, a mice a, a, in the tree in the bark and you know, crevices and hopping along and, and mo moving along. That's a really good description of them. But they, you talk about a powerful powerful little song for a tiny, tiny bird. This is the smallest of our wrens, and it, it they are powerhouses when it comes to singing. Listen to this. I remember I had a bird watching group up in Maine several years ago, and we had one of these little sneaky things singing like that, uh, and we never did get to see it. It just kept down in the in the low bushes, and it was pretty thick where we were, but that song just kept coming and coming and coming from that underbrush, and that's how they are. Um, I think it, it may be a little easier to find in the winter when there's no leaves on the trees and things like that, but they are... Uh, very northern in nature, both the Pacific Wren and the Winter Wren. Very northern, and then uh, it, it's further south, and especially for the Winter Wren for us, we get to see them in the the. Uh, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit more in a few minutes. I add them to it. Um, it here it is that the because both can occur here in winter. It it uh, in the very very southern states. Uh, uh, some house wrens will winter down there. They don't winter here in our area, uh, but it'd be further south. And the winter wrens may um, deep dip that far in the south, southern states, and the two birds will, might be there at the same time. But look at the difference in the tail. The, uh, the, the little winter wrens have little bitty tails. I mean, little bitty tails. And uh, for the, the house wren, they have you know, a, a, a longer tail for sure, but both of them do tend to cock it up in the air, like the, especially the winter wren's doing here. So that's two that you can uh, can get it confused if they happen to be in the same location, or you need to look at them fairly closely. And for the most part, the winter wrens are darker, um, and like I said, the house wrens usually aren't here in the winter, but if it, it could occur. So thought I'd throw that in there to separate those out. Now we're going to go out west. Now the rest of the wrens particularly are more Western in nature, the cactus wren, which is just as its name uh, described, it is a desert bird. This is one of the true sounds of bird watching in desert regions. It, it uh, I had a buddy who um, used to spend his the winters in uh, Southeast Arizona uh, you know, for his health uh, conditions. So, and we visited him a couple of times and his nickname for the cactus wren he called him Old Marble Throat uh, because of the raspiness of their, their song. I'm going to play this for you. This is from Arizona. And they are the largest of our wren. They're a really good size wren. Um, and uh, it, it, real striking, probably the most colorful in appearance or uh, than, uh, that we have, but truly, truly a bird of the desert. And they uh, they build you know, multiple nests, you know, like big, thick balls. Most wrens do build ball nests, and then they have a hole into where they're going. Um, and they live in the sharpest of cactuses, and they get in and out of there. Uh, but again, true insect eaters. They, they, they like all the rest of them. A couple of other Western uh, wrens uh, that are real dry country uh, specialists and uh, are the canyon wren and the rock wren. Uh, you see their ranges are right the same region. They both like really rocky, uh, dry areas. And both so 
So much so, and like the cactus wren who lives in very dry areas, they hardly drink water at all, like none. They get their the moisture they need from their insects. So water, it can be very, very dry where they are, and they can still survive as long as they're getting insects. Now, the insects got to have some water, that's for sure. But, you know, insects require very little water. So uh, the canyon wren and the rock wren are definitely birds of uh, of really uh, the western dry areas. The canyon wren, I think, is a gorgeous bird with the orange. Uh, I remember when Melanie and I were out in Arizona, and she said, Mark, what's that orange bird on the side of this tree? And I looked over, and there was a canyon wren uh, on the side of the tree in Madera Canyon, a famous bird watching spot down there. And they have a really long, both of them have really long bills because they specialize in rock crevices, you know, getting up in there uh, and, and pulling out bugs. That's where they live and that, that's where they nest or up in rock crevices as well. Uh, and they are, uh, Roger Troy Peterson, the great ornithologist, of my, the godfather of the, Amer the American field guide, bird field guide, uh, says that the canyon wren is one of the prettiest songs in North America. Let's see what you guys think of this. It's a beautiful sound to me. Love that cascading sound. And you hear that in can you know, rock face walls and canyons. You hear that echoing and that, that ascending sound, the descending, descending sound. It is you a really a beautiful song. And they're a beautiful bird. I love getting to see them. I don't see them very often because I only when I get out west and do do some bird watching out there, and I have to kind of go looking for them. And then the rock wren which they say you know, has like a hundred different sounds that can make a, very, a, a songster again, but most people don't have them in their backyard because of their habitat. They, they live in rocky, dry areas. Matter of fact, the picture on the right of the rock wren was taken by a friend of mine in the Badlands of South Dakota, uh, Badlands National Park. And I mean, it is dry and, you know, desolate there. And this is where she took that picture. So take play the, the, the rock wren for you. They are great birds. They then again, uh, finding insects where there are very thing, very few things alive, and <laughs> where they live in this very dry country. Now, the two final wrens that we have are wetland slash grassland uh, birds. Uh, they again, not a bird you're going to find in your backyard unless you've got uh, the right habitat. Uh, and and uh, the sedge wren and the marsh wren. Now, in the if you've got an old field guide. You'll, have, you'll see uh, the two birds in there. They'll be called the long-billed marsh wren and the short-billed marsh wren. They finally changed the name, and they gave you know the sedge wren its own name, the sedge wren, and the marsh wren dropped long-billed off of it. So, uh, But they are the same, uh, uh, the birds that were in those old field guides. Uh, but they the, the marsh wren, as it indicates by its name, is very wetland-oriented. They, they are skulky birds of cattails and wet areas, uh, you know, it's really thick vegetation. They're, they're really secretive. And when we get to see them pop up in the open, it's, it's kind of rewarding. Um, and then the sedren is a, a really unique bird of grasslands. Uh, and if you, you know, that range map, you see how far it stretches up into the prairies, the prot holes and, of Canada and North America, uh, uh, the lower 48, so those regions up there. And one of the most fascinating things about the sedren is they finally figured out several years ago now, a few years ago, is that they when they migrate through here in the spring, we see them in the spring, we hear them in the spring, and some might stay in this, will stay in this, but the bulk of them go further up into the, those northern areas, and they'll nest in prairie regions up there. And then once they've pulled that nest off, they uh, come back through down through North America to the, the lower 48 states, states, and they will stop and qual uh, usually high quality prairie area remnants that are around. Um, and then they'll pull off a second nest. 
So they nest once way north and then once back here in the central U.S. and then uh, migrate uh, for, to the, for the winter down south. So it's they're a fascinating bird. And they, uh, my, when I do my, we do our breeding bird surveys and we listen for cedrons, um, especially uh, I call them the little machine gun. They may, uh, they may, they, prrr, they sound like that. So they click and then they do the fast call. We'll listen to this. That click, click grrr, sound of them. And, uh, and right now, boy, what, here in the next week or so, especially, uh, if you were to go up to Dunn Ranch, which is a property here that owned by the Nature Conservancy in Northern Missouri, Nature Conservancy in Northern Missouri, you will hear sudrens calling from all over. And that's because those birds are just returning and they're, they're singing for territory and they're going to pull off another nest now, which is great. It's, it's awesome. And then the long bill or the marsh wren, the formerly long billed uh, marsh wren, uh, are again birds of more wet areas, and uh, they uh, their song is a bit different. It, uh, so you kind of have to go looking for these two birds. They're not typically going to be in your backyard or in your neighborhood, uh, but that you know one of the things that uh, I love the being a bird watcher is when I start, I'm, I'm a lister. I love to, you know, keep up with my birds and what I see. And then when you start with that, you go, okay, I want to see all the wrens. <laughs> I want to see all the kingbirds. I want to see all the warbirds. And, you know, and, and it, you, you tick them off one by one as you, uh, as you bird. Now, if you want to go see and, and, and really expand your list on wrens, you got to go, like I say, to the neotropics down around the equator and uh, that, that area. There are tons of wren species down there in that part of the world. So the wrens are a great group of birds. Uh, they're, like I said, they're one of our best friends. They eat tons of insects and they, they help clean the bugs out of our gardens that are eating our plants and flowers. So they're well worth attracting to your yard. So Food, water, and shelter provide for them, and you can have wrens in your yard too. So great idea for a program. Please give us a like, give us a share. And if you're on YouTube, if you haven't yet, please subscribe. Until then, come by. Let's talk birds.